So as a Cleveland fan, you know what's going to happen. However, you don't know all the pieces that were happening behind the scenes. Right. It reads like a movie script. Do you know if LeBron read it? With your job as a writer and covering the Cavs, mm -hmm. How much time did it take for players to trust you? That 15 minute meeting at Starbucks turned into about two and a half hours. Mm -hmm. And I left Starbucks going, okay, this is, this is real. So let's just start with the big question, Jason Lloyd, who knows all things LeBron <laughs> and Cavs. Is he staying here or is he leaving? Oh boy. boy, you're not messing around. You're coming out swinging. <laughs> I figured let's just start big. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I've i tried to avoid answering this as often as possible because so much can change between now and June, and I think a lot is going to depend on how this season is. But if I'm being perfectly honest, I don't have a good feeling about him coming back. No, I, I think this is probably it. Um, okay, so this is where it gets tricky because you like want to think – Logically, sure, right? Sure. But then you have the emotional side of you, especially if you're from Cleveland. Right. And, you know, you're here for the whole homecoming. You think, like, there's, he's coming back. Like, there's no way he'll ever leave again, no matter what. Right? It was right. the way that he came back was so beautiful. Yeah, it was. Like, it, was it was so poetic. Um, you write a book, The Blueprint, and we'll get into that, but it's the whole blueprint of how we got him to come back and what needed to happen and yep. how everything was so beautifully orchestrated. Yep. Um, it seems impossible that he would want to leave. First of all, I guess most importantly, he came, he did what he came here to do. He won a championship. He got to live in a championship. And I know people want more and that's certainly understandable. But, you know, he had said last year, I think he told a colleague of mine, Joe Varden, that, you know, I've, I've, I've done everything you know, I don't have any, I don't have anything left to prove to anybody, mm -hmm. and so I think he feels like bringing that championship here has freed him uh, to do whatever he wants and to go wherever he wants. Um, so, you know, I mean, it's not a secret that him and Dan don't have the best relationship. You know, I don't think that's a secret. Uh, there's not much of a relationship there, and it's been a lot of decisions that have been made over uh, the course of the last six months, really since really since the end of last summer and. You know, David Griffin leaving and the trade of Kyrie Irving. And there's been a lot of things that have happened within the organization um, that has put this franchise in a much different spot than what they were when he came back. Now, if the Cavs turn this thing around and if they're back in the finals, you know, Kevin Love told me the other night he still absolutely 100% thinks like this team can still win a championship. And if that happens, that's a game changer. You know, so much can change between now and June. There's just something that happens when it's time to, when it's, it's really time and when it's really supposed to count yeah. it's like he's like superman he plays like an animal i've had gm say before he paces himself through the regular season you know this is a guy who's played in seven straight finals nobody's ever since since you know we're talking bill russell in the 60s and the celtics the last time that a team has played in this many finals uh for him to play in seven straight finals it just doesn't happen and so he he knows how to take care of his body he knows how to pace himself he can't play at the level he plays at in April, May, and June for an entire season. It's physically impossible. Yeah. It's amazing that he can do what he can do as long as he can do it. But, you know, the joke, the running joke was Michael went to three straight finals and had to retire. And then he went to three more and then he retired again because it's so draining and it takes so much out of you when you're playing for so long. When this starts in October and you play until mid-June, uh, you know, and LeBron starts his three-day conditioning programs in September. So he goes from September to June with no breaks. So just the emotional toll, the physical drain that it, that it takes on you, we, we've never seen it in our, you know, most of us have never seen it in our lifetimes. So he understands that he does flip a switch in April, May, and June. He may not, he may not admit to that, but he does. He takes his game to a different level. With your job as a writer and covering the Cavs, mm -hmm. How much time did it take for players to trust you? And do you feel that they do trust you? Yeah, they do. That's a, that's a really good question and something that um, people probably don't understand a whole lot. So here's a good example. When Kevin Love first came here, Kevin despised the media. Despised the media. He felt like he got burned in Minnesota. He got burned on a national story in Minnesota. And he did not trust anybody when he got here. 
and I felt like for whatever reason I, it became my goal to like turn him and now Kevin is fantastic with us but it took winning the championship it took four years of trust it took a lot to get to the point where we are but we are at the point where you know he can, all of them not just him but all of them even LeBron I think I have a great relationship with LeBron where they can tell us things that we know we're not going to burn them on and write and it becomes tricky because you have to have a trust the public wants to know wants us to write everything that we know and I get that I understand that but we cannot possibly write everything that we know because if we did that it would be the end of the information that we get because no one would ever trust us to write anything else so there have been times in my career where people will they'll give you information but it's like okay I don't want you to write this, but here's what's happening with X, Y, and Z. And then it may come about where a couple of weeks later, I can then negotiate with them and say, hey, I want to write this. And they'll say yes or no, you know, whatever. But you still have to respect the source and the place where you got the information. If somebody tells you, you can't write this and you agree not to write it, but you still want to have the information so you get a clear understanding of the picture in front of you, you have to respect that and honor that and not write it. And so there have been things where I sat on and never wrote. There have been things where I get told something and then eventually I can write it. But it's a, it's a trust that builds up. And, you know, I'll give you another good example. When we were in Houston last year, the year before, I walk in the locker room during the open locker room time. And half the players in the locker room are killing a couple of, of recent NBA players. Just wearing them out, killing them about how awful they are. And they see me and they're like... So I'm not going to write it. Be, now, you know, it's in there during open locker room time. I'm not doing anything wrong. I'm in there when I'm supposed to be in there. I yeah. could easily write that and have, like, this huge, juicy story. But is it really worth it in the long run? It's yeah. not worth it because it's – what are you going to gain from it? So by not writing that little nugget of, like, guys killing these couple of players, you build that trust with them to where they can then give you better stuff down the road that you can use. So smart. I do wonder, though, for your own knowledge, do you ever just keep a diary so one day you can tell your grandchildren <laughs> some good stories that maybe nobody else yeah. would know about? <laughs> you, know, you, you know what's funny is, you know my wife. Yes. I love your wife. Alessia could call me and say, hey, bring grab some milk and bread on your way home. There is zero chance I'm going to remember to bring home bread. Zero <laughs> chance. And she knows this. Zero. But... I remember every converse, every conversation I've had with every agent, GM, coach. I could tell you where we were standing. I could tell you if it was on the phone. I could tell you what I was doing when they told me what they told me. I can remember exactly what they said. It's weird. So I don't keep. I, I started keeping a journal this year of some of some things here and there, just because when I wrote the book, a lot of it was from memory, and I thought, boy, this would be a lot easier if I had written some of this stuff down. So I have started jotting notes down here and there of some just random quirky things, but for the most part. I can't remember anything in daily life. I'm an absolute disaster. But when it comes to work, I remember everything. So I don't even have to write anything down. But, yeah, I do have some cool stories that I can tell one day when everyone's retired or something. You know, maybe I'll do another book. Who knows? But um, there's definitely some stuff that, that I have that I haven't written that's pretty fascinating. Well, you're an incredible writer. <laughs> an you. incredible writer. Um, the Blueprint, with its five mile long subtitle so I'll try to <laughs> <laughs> LeBron James Cleveland's Deliverance and, and the, the making, making of the modern, modern NBA can I pull a curtain back on that <laughs> I did yeah. not name the book I did you not didn't? It. No. I, because there's so much thought that goes into the title of a book. I did not name the book. So what was the original title that the you wanted to get nobody, nobody knows this. The original title of the book that I wanted uh -huh. was Ringleader Okay. Because it's always a circus wherever LeBron goes, and he led them to the rings. He led them to championship. I wanted ringleader, but uh, Penguin Random House, who um, bought the manuscript, changed it to LeBron James, Cleveland's Deliverance, and the Making of the Modern NBA. Yes, it's a very long title. Yes. So for short, we can, we'll call it the Blueprint. The Blueprint, yes. Now I. Because I'm always on the go, I'm very busy. Mm -hmm. I'm so busy. <laughs> that sounded wrong. I'm so important. I'm so busy. <laughs> I listen to the audio version. Okay. 
That's smart. I haven't, I haven't even done that. You have to because I had chills. I had a moment where I was going to start to cry. It is so exciting because you know what's going to happen. Yeah. Let's just put it this way. So for those who have not yet read the book or listened to the book, it starts at the beginning of when LeBron leaves Cleveland. Correct. And then it takes us close to present day, but to after, you know, through winning a championship and mm-hmm. then mm-hmm. losing a championship. So as a Cleveland fan, you know what's going to happen. However, you don't know all the pieces that were happening behind the scenes. Right. And so that part to me is fascinating. Yeah. And um, literally really is a blueprint yeah. of what happened. Yeah. So as a writer, you're a writer. Um, it seems obvious that one day you would write a book. Had you always wanted to write a book? Uh, I thought about it. Um, but it wasn't really forefront of my mind. I thought maybe someday. And and it's funny as this came about, you know, I, I, I knew I had, after they won the championship, I knew I had this in my head that I had this. But I didn't have an agent. I didn't, like, I didn't pursue it very hard of I want to do a book because I was busy with work and everything else. And, you know, we talk about the toll that it takes on players going to so many finals. It's actually taxing on <laughs> us of course to, it would be because we're you know we're traveling just as much as they are and we're going commercial so it's just it's exhausting and we got through the end of the championship and I was drained I had nothing left and I thought man I'm, I'm not doing it and my who is now my agent um Bridget had emailed me we were on vacation we were on the east coast on vacation and she had emailed me and said do you have any interest in writing a book and I thought I told her I said I'm the only one who has covered this team from the day LeBron left to the day he came back I have the whole story and I'm the only one that has it she's like we're doing it so I talked to Alessia about it I'm like alright let's do this so I took the whole month of September Alessia's your wife Alessia's my wife yes yeah. yes uh-huh. Alessia's mm-hmm. my wife so I talked to her and I said alright let's do this so the entire month of September um, after they won the championship they won it in June so that September I wrote probably 20,000 words and we turned in the manuscript uh, that part of the manuscript we sent it to a bunch of different publishing houses and Dutton, which is a underneath Penguin, loved it and bought it, and then I spent all of last season writing this book. And everyone says, "Will you do another one?" I said, "I don't know if I'll ever do another one, but I guarantee you, I will never do another one while I'm covering an NBA team, 82 games, traveling." That was nuts. I don't know how you did it. I took off All Star. There were nights. There was about three or four nights where I didn't go to bed. I'd I'd put the kids to bed at nine o'clock, and I'd go to my office and I would write till 7 a.m. because that's the only time and I did a lot of writing on the road Mm -hmm. and all-star weekend last year I didn't go to all-star game the book may still not be done if I didn't take off all-star weekend because I I probably cranked out four chapters just over all-star weekend last year and helped wrap it up it reads like a movie script really it's very very exciting I loved it do you know if LeBron read it I don't know if he read it I was actually going to give him a copy and I haven't done that yet, and that's on me. I should have given it to him. He probably has not read it, but I promise you the people around him have read it. It wasn't like a TMZ kind right. of book, and right? That's what I, told like, I feel everyone. like it was very fair. Right. That's why I told him. I'm like, listen, it has a happy ending. You won. Mm-hmm. You did something very interesting yeah. in your career. So when you're um, a writer, the great writers write for newspapers, right? Um, but newspapers have certainly struggled and yep. many would say they become dinosaurs, but still you had this great beat with yep. the Akron Beacon Journal. Um, and then you decided to leave and become editor in chief and write for the athletic Cleveland. And a lot of people may go the athletic. The what? what? Nobody that? knew about it. No. Right. So it's funny. It's a funny story behind that. So they had contacted me that 15 minute meeting at Starbucks turned into about two and a half hours. And I left Starbucks going, okay, this is this is real. And you're you're hundred percent right. Nobody knows the future of newspapers. It's not it's not good. It doesn't look good. I would love to see newspapers be able to pull out of this, find a way to be successful, find a giving away the product for twenty years, shockingly was not the answer. I know it's hard to believe that giving <laughs> things away for free for twenty years was not a great business model. Nope, not going to make any there, money if you're giving there, it away for free. There's no other business in America where you give away your product for free and expect to be viable, but newspapers for some reason. Mm. So now they're trying to put the genie back in the bottle, and it's very difficult. What The Athletic is doing, yes, it is subscription-based, but we are trying to find the very best writers around the area 
and bring them all together. And for a couple bucks a month, you get this great content on an easy to use app. The layout on the desktop is fantastic. The pictures are great. And it makes sense because what for a handful of subscribers, we can make the same amount of money that, you know, 20,000 clicks on a, on a story on the internet on a non-paid site will generate. Well, and everybody, everybody's using their phone for everybody's everything. Using their phone. Yeah. We do the same thing. Yeah. Cleveland was the third market they came to. They launched in Chicago. They launched in Chicago because of the Cubs, and they thought it was going to be a good season for the Cubs, and the Cubs wound up winning the World Series that year. So that's where they launched. And then they went to Toronto, and they had great success in Toronto. We were the third stop. Isn't that interesting? Yeah, it's it fascinating. is. Yeah, it is. And they were just they were trying to identify markets based on um, the writers, writers that they think are attainable. They're, they're building this thing around the writers and writers that people seem to enjoy to read. So, so not necessarily the celebrity of the players in a city right. as much as the writer. Yeah, but is... I mean, the, the city, in, in our case, the Cavs and LeBron certainly played a big role in that. Mm-hmm. Certainly, 100% yes. But And they said, like, this is going to sound awful, but they said if we didn't get you, we probably would have just moved to the next city. Because they want, if and, and that's what makes it so easy. Now we're in 15 markets across the U.S. and Canada and still growing. we got more markets coming on every month. But they base it on, we're going to target that city, and we want riders X, Y, and Z. If we don't get them, that's okay. We won't go there. We're going to go over here, and then eventually we're going to have such credibility and name brand, we will go back and we will get writer X, Y, and Z. See, they're aggressive. They're on the move. They're not waiting around for anything. Yeah. I think that just shows you that they believe in the formula, they believe in the program, yeah. and that it's working. people will come to them. It's working. We're growing. Um you know, they've, You're clever with the way you write, too, because you give this caption, and people are going to want more, yeah, yeah. and they're only going to get a little bit right, more, right, so right. Yeah, it's, you it's better a, subscribe to read no, it all. There's no way to get through the paywall. Like, there's a lot of other sites, you know, where maybe you can go Google incognito and get around <laughs> the paywalls and this and that. You can't do that with us. It's a, it's a hard paywall, but it's only a couple bucks a month. It's, it's you know, a cup of coffee at Starbucks will get you the entire, if you pay for the full year. And one cup of coffee will get you the entire site. And that's all the markets. It's all the national writers, Ken Rosenthal, Peter Gammons, um, you know, hockey. They're huge in hockey. It's 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 really good. Now, um, I listened to Pandora and I couldn't help but laugh because I agreed with LeBron. I wasn't gonna pay for my subscription. Do you know if LeBron pays for a subscription to the athletic? I don't think he does. <laughs> um, I Steph Curry does. And Draymond Green do in the in the Bay Area. I know again. Sorry, I know how they're how they're viewed and felt. But they do have subscriptions. Uh, we went to the Bay Area very aggressively, and they took like the top three writers who have anything to do with covering the Warriors, and they've had great success in the Bay Area. So I don't think uh, LeBron subscribes, but they we have given uh, the Cavs have a couple of accounts. The Cavs bought an account, so they have ways to see it. They see. It. If you think this Mercedes-Benz CLA might be the perfect car for you to drive around in, click on the link below and learn more.